Greetings, chosen lady, and all those who share our like faith. Today's mug, I didn't get the mug. It's just water, all right? And I'm going to drop that. That's the advantage of it. It's sealed. I'm so glad you've joined us. For those who are following this in real time, I know it's been a couple of days, but um, rest is very important, and I had to get a little bit of rest before I came back online, so to speak. <laughs> um, so today, we're continuing our spiritual support for single sisters series that was out of order too i told you i got to the 10th time not going to correct myself too much brain power got to focus it right here um i'm in a quiet place but the wind is really working today so here's your homework assignment hey read john chapter 3 and see what jesus said about the wind a little bit of a mystery there all right so um where are we in our series our series uh we were talking about last time uh, grace, mercy, and peace, and we're in the book of 2 John, and um, really, we um, only got through verse 3. I'm taking this line by line, very slowly, 21 or so sessions, right? Um, and I had to break lesson 6 up into 2. Um, there was a reason for that, and it's a very simple reason. My camera cut off. So I did a whole lot of talking for no reason. <laughs> I guess it was a rehearsal. Uh, but I was definitely preaching to myself. So here we are on lesson seven, uh, and it's really the eighth video, but I won't get into all of that. We'll call it lesson seven. Um, and we're looking at 2 John, which is a letter written to single sisters, all right? And their family, all right? It's to the chosen lady and her children. There's no husband addressed there. I'm pretty sure that she was single. Um, but uh, let's look at what we've read so far if it's your first time joining us it says the elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth and not I only but also all who love the truth because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever grace mercy and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son will be with us in truth and love okay and so uh, that is kind of where we are and then uh, John goes on to say in verse 4 it has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth just as the Father commanded us okay so let's review again what we talked about before um, just a couple of uh, notes we talked about personal repentance okay because this time we're going to take a look at how you um, prepare yourself and are able to have the right prism when it comes to potentially meeting um, a man, all right? Or for judging for your kids, which is really gonna be a future conversation, but it's kind of the same uh, criteria, just to apply differently. Um, so today we'll focus just on you, and um, if you're interested in you know, possibly being married in the future, um, maybe some guidelines on how to get ready for that. So um, in personal repentance, again, there's grace that's given to you from God as a gift. Then there's mercy where you bring to God your need um, and ask him for it. And then there's peace that comes from knowing that God can meet that need, will meet that need in his own time, and he'll educate you on it the closer you get to him and more relationship time with him, which we'll talk about today. Okay, so your personal consistent life of repentance, which is different than confession, Confession is you state to God what you've done wrong, asking for forgiveness, that's part of the mercy, and then um, repentance is a process where you begin to uh, walk in change, all right? So if uh, I have a, a habit of going beyond the evening with my anger, right, if I go to sleep at night angry with someone and then I wake up the next day I'm still angry with them and I read in the Bible that you not you should not let the Sun go down on your anger well I have an issue because the word says this in my life is like that so how do I get things in the balance I've got to start practicing that one little thing daily okay by the end of the day I'm not gonna be angry with this individual and I've got to go make it right with that individual okay not an easy thing to do that's just one example of how you can have personal repentance it's a process and you'll you'll have times where you fail right so this is all review now let's talk about the implementation of the word of god in your personal life we won't have enough uh sessions to talk long about 
how to uh, implement that, you're going to have to do a little uh, introspection and look at yourself. I'm just going to pick three things that I commonly see as a pastor um, that are, you know, struggles for a lot of people. All right. Especially our, our we're focusing on our ladies, especially, um, but all people uh, pretty much deal with this, and especially in America, which is my greatest experience as a pastor. Right. So let's focus on those for a minute. Here's the first big one. Can you guess it? Biggest struggle for a lot of people, sexual purity. All right, that's the first one. Okay, sexual purity. Um, what does it mean to be sexually pure? Well, a lot, <laughs> but the easiest uh, start would be not having sexual contact outside of marriage between a man and a woman. That is how I have been raised and taught in the Bible. I believe that's what the scripture says, that marriage is between a man and a woman, and that marriage um, is something that is scriptural, and that God honors it, and you don't have sexual intimacy outside of that, what I just described. So if you're a single person, you should not be having sex at all. So I'll pause right there. Pause. You should not be having sex at all as a single person. And so let me divide that up into two things. As I told you, I'm just not old, pull any punches here. Um, we should not be having sexual intimacy with another person if we're single. Okay? Any person. Okay? I don't care if that person is someone that you are engaged to or you are dating, okay? Um, sexual intimacy is for marriage. And you might say to yourself, well, you know, I gotta know what I'm working with. And I've heard people say that. What, what, what does that mean? Where did you get that from, okay? Uh, you're saying, I need to try before I buy. Where did that come from? How is that biblical? Is that what God said to do? And you know, a lot of times there's wisdom out there that's worldly wisdom, it, it's opposite God's. And so if it is not aligned with God's wisdom, then where did it come from? It came from the enemy, it came from the devil, it came from the demonic world, it came from a person that does not believe in the Lord. It came from a person that says they believe in God but they don't believe the Bible. It came to a person who is justifying their personal sin by making statements like uh, God doesn't care as long as it's love. Okay, that's them justifying what they're doing. Okay, they're cheating on their spouse. They're the single person sleeping around. They're trying to justify themselves and they may have a PhD. They may have a reverend title. They may be a chaplain or whatever they are. Um, they may be some leader in your church and they're going around saying, you know, uh, you know, hey, it's okay as long as it's love. You know, and I, I remember a church environment where I was in vacation Bible school with teenagers and the teacher said, you know, hey, you shouldn't be uh, having sex before marriage. But in case you do, here's condoms and started talking about condoms. <laughs> you know, what kind of message is that? Like, you know, all the teens got from that was, well, here's condoms. You know, that's all that, that was remembered from that, not the statement of you shouldn't be doing it. Um, so uh, we got to go all in. Now, where does the scripture say it? All right. The scripture uh, says that we should honor the uh, marriage bed and keep it holy. Uh, the scripture says that God brought Eve to Adam and the two became one flesh. Um, Paul says that we should not be committing sexual immorality. Um, you know, th there is almost every letter to the church in the Bible, almost every church letter talks about abstaining from sexual immorality. And what, what the argument is you know, most people don't argue that the Bible says that. What they argue is the interpretation of what that is, okay? And what a lot of people say is that, hey, you know, if two people love each other, then God's not talking about that. <laughs> well, if a man loves you, he'll marry you because that's God's institution. Again, we go to Malachi, why did God make them one? To bring forth godly offspring, okay? Um, God had a plan for marriage, to bring forth godly offspring. And you might say, hey, wait, I was married and you know, I was barren, I never had kids before my divorce, and I'm just one of those people that's, that's never had kids. Or you might say, I've never been married and I'm 60, I'm beyond childbearing, so I shouldn't get married? No, that's not what it's saying. 
um, godly offspring come in a lot of different forms. They can be adopted. They could be because you have a kids ministry. They could be because, you know, uh, you take care of kids on your street that, that, that don't, you know, have a, a parent in their household that believes in God. Okay. So being sexually pure is very important. Paul talks about to abstain from sexual immorality. And when we don't do that, we desecrate um, the temple of the Holy Spirit, that any other sin is outside your body. But when you sin sexually, you're desecrating God's temple. And why not err on the side of abstaining? What harm would it bring? If someone loves you, they will want to marry you. So in other words, let me make it plain. If a guy says to you, if we ain't doing that, I'm walking, let him go because they don't love you. They like the act that you're participating in. If they loved you, they would wait on you. You know, I met my wife in October of 1995 and we did not have sex, sexual relations until we got married in uh, June of, of, of 1997 we got married okay I had to think about it it was June <laughs> um, but we Joyce got pregnant in like August and then my firstborn was born approximately nine months later and uh, for those of you who read my bio you know the dates were wrong if you're trying to walk the dog back and say oh man as old as kid is this age and they said that the, he said he was married this long and they were fooling around and they, she got pregnant in her shotgun wedding no we did not have sexual relations until after we were married. It can be done, okay? And I was not a virgin when I got married. I was out in sin. And um, if I can be frank, it wasn't one partner. I told you I was gonna just just, just tell you. Um, so, you know, uh, Joyce accepted me even though I had been with multiple women. But because I had been with multiple women, I had to say, hey, Lord, I sinned. I sinned against these people. Um, you know, I sinned against their parents. I, I sinned against, uh, you know, every young lady who I got close to me and I walked away from. Lord, forgive me. And Lord, show me the right way. And so, thankfully, uh, the Lord showed me that I could be celibate and not go off into relationships. Um, you know, winning a heart of a young lady and even... Because you can be intimate without being sexual. So you should be intimate with someone that you're not planning to marry if you're a man. Okay? So if a guy is being intimate with you, and that is time spent, sharing, getting closer, your eyes are all starry, you know, you, you look like that emoji with the hearts in your eyes, um, and then that person has no intentions of marrying you, but they're letting you get that close, that's not right either. Even if you're not being sexual, because, um, you know, it's a, there's a intimacy that is spiritual and mental as well, okay? so. Here's my uh, household um, definition of dating. Dating is an interview process for marriage, okay? Otherwise, just be friends. And if you're single, there's nothing wrong with having friends of the opposite sex. Just be careful if your heart starts going to that person and you're hanging around wanting to be married and you're totally in that man's eyes in the friend zone, okay? So there should be open communication, all right? There's so many things I could talk about. We're going to have to have another episode on this. We really are. All right, so the next one, uh, uh, not just sex, but substances. Okay, substances. Do you have any substances that you consume that impair your judgment? I'm talking about common things that I run into. Are you self-medicating? Okay. Do you drink alcohol in order to feel better? Do you take the things that have been legalized and smoke them or smell them or whatever it may be, bath salts, whatever it is, um, to alter your reality so you can feel better. Um, do you go and it's beyond, uh, you know, uh, what we consider illegal or legal drugs. Um, it's all, and, and, and legal drugs can be like that too. Do you take Benadryl to put yourself to sleep every night because you don't want to think, you know? Um, but also it can be food eating. You know, are you disciplined? Do you eat to feel better? Hey, I do it. I do eat to feel better, and that's one of the things that I'm really working on. Um, you know, you might be looking at me and saying, you're not a, you know, an overweight person. Well, I got things that, you know, you might not be seeing, and I might have a generally slim build, but I'm, right now, I'm over my, what I call sparring weight, my healthiest weight where I can run the fastest, where I'm the strongest. I'm over that weight. You probably don't know what that is. I know what it is. 
Joyce knows what it is. And what's a part of that? Lack of eating discipline, okay? So be disciplined with anything that you put in your body, whether it be a drug or something like that, where you are, um, what's the word? A, a substance, something that you are using uh, to make yourself feel better that's distracting you from God's will, whatever that is, okay? Smoking cigarettes, do you chain smoke? Okay, should you be smoking at all? Um, I recommend that people don't smoke. Nicotine is a drug, all right? It's just a recommendation. I can't make you do it. It doesn't break your salvation if you smoke. But again, why are you smoking? Why are you drinking until you get a buzz? Why are you eating that chocolate every single day? Um, these are the things that kind of take um, away from spiritual discipline, okay? Uh, what's the third one? Uh, so we talked about, um, again, sex, substances, idolatry is the third one, okay? Um, hey, do I have one on me? It's in the car, uh, my iPhone. Uh, you know, if you can hold up your phone, like, do you use it as an idol? Do you spend more time on your phone or your iPad or whatever your gadget is, your tablet, your computer, your television? Do you spend more time looking at whatever it may be, fantasizing with the little, you know, and even, you know, the little wholesome lifetime movies. Are you always in a lifetime movie? See, this is going to expectations. I wish I could pull you into a singles retreat. Maybe I'll do one of those, who knows? Um, but um, in, a, in our singles retreats in the army, they're really good. We talk about expectation management. What is your expectation for marriage? See, if you had been, uh, whatever your age is, in 1946-ish, when the World War II was winding down and people were coming back off the boat or whatever, um, people were surviving World War II and saying, if I survive this Lord, and this was one sailor's prayer, he got shipwrecked, uh, <laughs> and sharks were uh, swimming around in the water, and he, uh, they were, coming for you know sailors and this sailor said lord if you give me a reprieve i will go home i will stop doing my sins i'll marry a nice girl and i will do what's right and sad part of it the shark bypassed him and did pull someone else into the water and killed him that sailor survived and he did that he went and he married a nice girl and you know a lot of uh, sailors you know uh, military people army uh, folks got married they didn't hardly know the young lady and they stayed married all of their lives my grandmother got married that way um, and my grandmother became a widow unfortunately but my grandfather met her on the train going up to Chicago um, and she met her in Mississippi on the train and he said I'm gonna marry that girl and he did just that and they had my uh, you know the two of them had my uh, mom and my uncle respectively but he passed away when my grandmother was four more to follow on that i'll talk to you about it because she's a widow that i know very well um, she's with the lord now so um you know that's the question what is your expectation back then the expectation was marriage is hard it's difficult we're going to work together and we're going to stay together that was the expectation there was not this expectation that we have today where there's going to be you know i'm going to meet prince charming he's going to be wonderful and he's going to have all these things on my list he's going to be six foot three or taller he's going to have you know whatever your favorite build of a man is he's going to be my ethnicity he's going to be my denomination and he's going to have this kind of car and i'm exaggerating a little bit but some women you know they go there um and there's this huge expectation and guess what every guy you meet doesn't measure up you know, he doesn't measure up because your expectation is too high. Where are you getting your expectation from? Where do we get them from? You make a list. Do that. Homework assignment. Write down where do we get our, where do I get my expectations of marriage? What's the source? Is it movies? Is it what you see on YouTube? Is it what your cousin did? Is it what your mama said you gotta have? Is it, uh, you know, something that you just dreamed of at your fantasy? Is it Cinderella? Is it the Barbie doll that you look at in the Ken doll when you were a kid? That I want, I want a Ken. You know, as we age as men, we look less like Ken. We just don't. Okay, 18 years old, you might look like Ken in your build. The older you get, the less like Ken you look. You lose your hair. You know, if you're like me, your 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 hairline recedes. You know, you get gray. You know, I could dye it, but I don't do that. I like the crown of splendor. You know what I mean? Are you comfortable with you? Where's your expectation for yourself? 
Is it realistic? You've got to have an expectation of marriage that is realistic. People sin, all right? So what is the criteria for a husband in the scripture? Believer. That is the only New Testament one that they drive home all the time. They must be a believer in Christ. Now, I'll give you the quick lowdown on what that means, and then I'll close out, okay? Because we'll have another session or two or three or ten on this, <laughs> on this subject, because it really is something that a lot of women talk to me about, okay? What does it mean to be someone who's a real deal believer? Look at Adam. What was Adam doing? He believed in God. He had an education. God made him name all the animals, and he, he was, um, you know, tending to the garden, getting educated on that. And he had a profession, horticulturalist or whatever you want to call it. He was tending the garden. And he was um, content with being single. Okay? That's, that's the, that is the, not perfect, but the ideal man has those four criteria. I'll say them again. Believer. I should add to that, walking in God's way, okay, an obedient believer doing the best they can, has an education, and what I mean by that, I'm not talking about even a high school diploma, I'm saying that they have a profession and they gotta be educated in that thing. They were trained in something, okay? So if a guy, if you're 21, and a guy just graduated from high school and you're all over the moon for him, that person doesn't, they haven't been trained in their profession yet. And they need to get their trade, before you, you know, start getting married and having babies, you know, because they got to take care of you. You got to be realistic. And if somebody just got out of jail, you know, they got to get a profession. You might, they might be single and they got saved in prison. You're like, I want to marry them tomorrow. I got a job. It's cool. That man's got to get a profession. Okay. Or if that person just lost their job. Okay. So they need an education and then they need to have a way to provide for you, whatever that is. And if you're more senior and that person's um, on Social Security and they got a pension, hey, they're, they're ready-made, they're, they're good, as long as they believe and they're walking with the Lord. Just know that they're not going to be like Adam. Adam, you know, was living right and then he sinned. Everybody else you meet is post-Adam, post the fall, so we've already been sinning when you meet us. <laughs> That's why we have to understand repentance, okay? So I'm getting a little long, turning it into a sermon and beyond the devotional format, but this is a very important topic. I will continue with it, I promise. I'm not going to close with a prayer. I'm asking you to pray. Read John 3. It talks about, uh, you know, being born again, and then also uh, make a list of where your expectations come from. And anyone that's not biblical, cross it out. Now, if you got a good one, like my mom and dad were believers and they stayed married all their lives before they passed away, that's a good one to circle that one, all right? Don't cross it out, okay? I'll talk more about it next time. I love you, but God loves you more. God bless.